Welcome back everybody to the criminal law. In this video we're going to take an introduction to sexual offences, the next major topic in our series of lessons focusing on specific criminal offences. Now sexual offences are very unique in a number of different ways, especially in terms of procedure, in terms of theory and in terms of evidence. Um, and we're going to try and touch on these in, in those kinds of details in this series of lessons, while also maintaining the fact that this is merely a series on the criminal law. And this is not a series on criminal evidence or even a series on criminal theory, which could be in the future um, lessons that we do. But for now, we're talking just about the criminal law. and like I said, we're moving away from the subject of homicide, which included um, murder and uh, the various different kinds of manslaughter offences, uh, and an examination of sexual offences. We'll spend some time in this lesson introducing and examining some of the theoretical implications when it comes to sexual offences, as well as talking about the development of the modern law on sexual offences, the implication that was had in relation to the imposition of statute into sexual offences with the passing of the Sexual Offences Act from 2003. Um, speaking of which, let's begin with that. Law reform is always a very interesting area that we have to always focus on and keep in the back of our mind because the Law Commission and the International Law Commission, depending on um, what jurisdiction we're talking about, is always constantly thinking about new and better ways in which we can um, model and design the law to, to, to serve the people uh, in ways that um, it should do. And sexual offences has always been an area that has a lot of difficulties, partly because of the uh, very, very low uh, conviction rate in comparison to the allegations of offences that have been committed, and and this also plays into the fact that the evidential burden for sexual offences is particularly difficult in a lot of circumstances, and also the societal perception of sexual offences are very difficult. As a result of which, it is not uncontroversial to say that sexual offences forms something of a unique bubble of criminal offences that are set apart from other types of offences like dishonesty offences or maybe non-fatal offences. Um, they are unique in their um, in their conduct, in how they're committed and, and in terms of how the criminal law deals with them. And so the Sexual Offences Act of 2003 represents a very considerable reform to the legal system, um, specifically around, as you can imagine, sexual offences and the criminal law. Now, there were a number of motivations for the reform to be in the form of sexual offences. So, um, uh, of course, there are academics and there are lawyers and there are and there are judges and there, there are um, solicitors and barristers who are always consistently critiquing elements of the law as they stand. And the Law Commission is, of course, tasked with the process of trying to make recommendations for reform and they have to make decisions for what to actually recommend for reform and for what parliament to eventually pick up on and, and actually take forward for reform. And it was considered um, in 2003, or at least before 2003, that sexual offences ought to receive some major and substantive reforms. In the 1990s, there was this public perception of sexual offences, uh, more so than other common law offences in England and Wales. So there was a general uh, societal impetus towards recognition of sexual offences and this um, ties into the fact that because of this growing public perception of sexual offences there's a growing critique of the law in its ability to deal with sexual offences at least when it comes to the original pre-2003 common law um, uh, method for 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 for, uh, for prosecution of sexual offences the public perception had a number of consequences. It showed quite substantially and quite clearly that the law was outdated as late as the 1990s. And it was also a considerable lack of convictions for sexual offences versus complainants. This is something that continues to uh, be a problem within the criminal law more broadly. Sexual offences, uh, in terms of allegations of sexual offences, are very, very high compared to their number of successful prosecutions, the successful convictions of sexual offences. There are a number of reasons why this is the case, and it's not really for this lesson to try and dive into the root cause of this particular problem. 
because it probably is an intersection of problems. There are problems in relation to the growing perception of sexual offences in society. Uh, that is on the part of the uh, of the persecutor, the person who is doing the sexual offences. But there is also a growing um, understanding, or at least a uh, or, or, or growth of ideas relating to the ways in which the complainants feel they would be perceived when they make complaints about sexual offences. Okay, um, often there are complaints that are made um, that that alleged victims. Um, don't feel heard in certain circumstances when they make allegations of sexual offences. There is often a quite substantial time element between the committing of the offence and the reporting of the offence, meaning that any kind of evidence of the offence is unlikely to uh, be around anymore. All of these are huge problems when it comes to trying to essentially prove an individual guilty of an offence, because one of the things that sits at the heart of all of this still is the presumption of innocence. And so sexual offences really do have this unique ability, or at least this unique inability, to actually be successful in a lot of um, instances. So we also see finally as well, um, in terms of the impetus to uh, major law reform, uh, a policy prescription made by the Home Office. Now, as I've mentioned already, and as I've as I've sort of alluded to earlier on in this video, that sexual offences has attached to it a number of unique procedural as well as theoretical implications. Despite the fact that men can also be the victim of sexual offences, for the most part, sexual offences are gendered crimes. This is um, an interesting element. Uh, a lot of violent crimes can actually be considered to be gendered crimes in a way. A lot of, uh, uh, but but sexual offences is um, incredibly skewed in terms of the gendered elements relating to it. It gives rise to a distinct lack in shared societal understanding. Okay, so the sort of epistemic uh, foundations from which we understand criminal offences is not shared consistently across all of society, given the fact that for the most part, when it comes to sexual offences, men are perpetrators and women are victims, and it is not really the other way around. For the most part, when it also comes to sexual offences, the majority of perpetrators are men and the uh, majority of victims are women, as I've just mentioned, um, which, again, gives a unique element to it. And that's why when we talk about criminal theory, there are lots of different critiques of sexual offences legislation and sexual offences law in um, lots of different areas of theoretical literature. So things like feminist theory have quite significant critiques of sexual offences litigation. In addition to this, and also from a theoretical perspective, sexual offences are perceived as violent acts. Now, crimes such as rape are described and perceived as violent acts. There is also deeper implications to be had there. They are not just mere assaults or mere ABH cases. Or they are, in reality... Um, uh, crimes which include fear and humiliation as well as the objectification of human beings so there is a far deeper psychological element relating to sexual offenses that is not necessarily recognized in other kinds of non-fatal um, attacks that are, that are done that is not to suggest therefore that um, if you are assaulted or, or or you somebody has committed abh or gbh against you um, you uh, don't suffer or can't suffer any kind of psychological harm as a result of that many people do but crime Crimes such as rape and, and sexual assault um, carry with it this significant psychological element as well. One of the reasons for this is the grounding of offences like rape in the general view of personal autonomy and the deprivation of choice and control. One of the things that sits at the heart of sexual offences is this view and this idea of consent, and consent essentially uh, pertains to the victim or the complainant's ability to choose uh, to or to not engage in sexual activity, um, and having that choice forced upon you against your will is something that is uh, very deeply enshrined within sexual offences law. Now, even when rape is accompanied by further acts, the objectification of a person is dehumanizing and the result of which is a denial of their personhood. So you can really get into the weeds relating to the theoretical implications and the harm that is done uh, as a result of sexual offenses, which gives us an indication as to why they are considered so serious in terms of the criminal law, why many sexual offenses have con uh, conditioned on them uh, life sentences, which we will get to in a second. 
So given this theoretical background and this theoretical understanding, I've not I've, I've barely scratched the surface of the theory because it, this again, this is not a, um, a theory lesson. We're talking about the law in terms of its substance and terms of its procedure. The Sexual Offences Act of 2003. Now, the following offences are found in sections 1 to section 4 of the 2003 Sexual Offences Act. Um, each, in each of the cases, it is up to the prosecution to uh, prove that the victim did not consent to the activity that is being cited and that the defendant did not reasonably believe that the victim had consented. So you have two elements that we have here. Not only do we have to show that there is a lack of consent um, in the case of the complainant making that um, uh, making the making the allegation heard, but it has to be a little bit more than that. Not only do you have to show that there is a lack of consent, but also that there is a lack of reasonable belief in consent uh, on the part of the defendant. Section 1 outlines the uh, crime of rape. Section 2 is assault by penetration. We'll get to the distinction and the difference between these two in, a se in, in future lessons that I say. Section 3 is sexual assault. And Section 4 is causing a person to engage in sexual activity without consent. Okay. Uh, when we get on to looking at sexual offences against children, um, these relate to sections, uh, I believe, 5 to 9 or 5 to 8, and they broadly mirror sections 1 to 4, but in relation to people who are under a certain age, um, depending on the kind of offence we're talking about, either under the age of 13 or under the age of 16. Uh, we'll get to all of this in future lessons time.